Hello there, four blue. So we return to our book, The Boy Who Sailed the Ocean in an Armchair. I am having to check every time I say that because it's such a long uh, title for a story. The Boy Who Sailed the Ocean in a Chair. Maybe I'll just call it The Boy Who Sailed in Future. So we return to page 35 and chapter three for the third edition of my reading. And I'm going to read you the final paragraph from chapter two as well as the suspense builds. It's Pearl, mumbles Billy. It's going to be okay. It's Pearl. Billy's voice trails off into a woolly wilderness as the person in the hallway begins speaking. It isn't Pearl. Chapter three. When we get back to the flat and after we've eaten, Billy and Sis spies always keep notes about their investigations. I say, I think that's a great idea. Billy says he is pleased about that because he can't write them what with him being only seven and not so good at spelling. So these are my notes about what happened on our first Snoop secret mission to 22 Cavalier Approach, Honeydown Hills. I present them without comment. Snoop, secret mission number one. Fact number one. The woman's voice we heard earlier wasn't Pearl, as I suspected. Billy said he knew it wasn't her all along. He made me add this bit to the notes. We heard the woman say she was going to paint the walls in pigeon grey. Billy whispered to me that this might be a clue. I said I had no idea how that was a clue to why Pearl wasn't there. Billy said he had no idea either, but it sounded like something a spy would say. Fact number two. There was a man with her. We heard the name Harry. We didn't think it was a red herring. He really was called Harry because she kept saying it over and over. Harry grunted a lot. At first, Billy thought he might be a gorilla. He wasn't. Fact number three. They were on the move downstairs, and so we needed a good hiding place. There were three options. The bathroom, but if we locked the door, they might think we were intruders and ring the police. B, we could sneak out of our bedroom window and shimmy down a pipe. I looked out to see how far down the garden was. No way, too dangerous, I decided. I saw something else, though. Pearl's portrait was lying in the garden, with a huge hole punched right through her face. It made my stomach feel bubbly. C. The airing cupboard. Billy suggested another option. How about we close our eyes and then no one would see us? Well, it was a suggestion, but I went with my own choice. And so C. It was. At this stage, once we got into the airing cupboard, Billy said the people downstairs were robbers in our house. I said they were not, because robbers do not usually talk about painting the walls. Billy said they might be robbers who cleaned up after themselves by painting the walls with a pigeon. I ignored him. What else could I do? Billy said spies in Snoop did not ignore each other. I said they did, if one spy had jelly for brains. Billy nudged me in the guts. Note. It hurt. I squealed. Billy said it was his invisible elbow that attacked me. I said there was no such thing as an invisible elbow. Billy said it was as real as his invisible tackle earlier. I said he was not very funny. Billy said I was not very funny either. Fact number four. As we argued, someone discovered our hiding place. Still, spies can control any situation they're presented with, so we pretended it was perfectly normal for one boy in a balaclava and another dressed as a sheep to be in an airing cupboard. At this point, Billy says he told the woman he was a spy with Snoop. He has asked me to write that down, although no one could hear him say it through the balaclava. So I can't present this as a fact, as there were no witnesses. Description of woman. Brown hair, scraped back in a ponytail, neck scarf that looked like a midnight sky, pregnant or has, a, or has swallowed a bowling ball. Description of man. Harry. Not an actual ape, although definitely from the same family, judging by the amount of hair poking out of the neck of his shirt. Quick rundown, rundown of what happened next. Billy said, we lived here. Woman said, we didn't. Woman said the people who lived there had done a flit because the estate agent they visited this morning told them so. He also said he like, he'd like someone to move in straight away and the previous tenants left behind their old furniture. Woman said she liked it here very much and it'd be perfect when they had the baby and she'd tell the estate agent so when she contacted him later. Billy, 
who wasn't in the slightest bit interested, asked where Pearl was, because she'd been living here with us for the past two years, and now she disappeared. Billy said Pearl used to love us to the moon and back, and that was a lot of love. He couldn't remember how many kilometres worth, but I could. 768,800. The woman asked if Pearl was our mother. Billy said she was our number two mummy. The man said, maybe he should ring our number one mummy and sort this mess out. I was so angry I told him that that could be tricky unless he had a hotline to God. The man said I was very lippy indeed. After that, I wanted to say he had more cheek than hamster. But instead I said, thank you very much. Then decided this was the time to do a U-turn. Actually, I meant U-turn, but when writing these notes, I realised U-turn, E-W-E, was funnier, so I went with that. Anyway, I turned around and told Billy to run. Billy did nothing, so I shouted, run, at the top of my lungs. Billy still didn't move, but I started running anyway and dragged him behind me by the top of his balaclava, which incidentally came off and gave away his identity. Billy has since said it doesn't matter because he pulled a funny face at the time and that meant no one could recognise him in the future. The woman yelled, Leave your key on the way out! I don't want to find you popping up in the toilet next time! I thought that only happened with rats. I didn't tell her that though, because I was too busy trying to run away as if I was a sheep escaping a sheepdog. I threw the key into the air. It arced like a tiny silver rainbow and then fell to the floor with a tinkle, like a heart shattering. As we ran down the road, Billy huffed. When we find Pearl, I'm going to ask her. Ask her what? I puffed back. Ask her why everyone leaves us in the end. Billy put his balaclava back on and that was that. This is the end of my notes on the first Snoop secret mission to 22 Cavalier Approach, Honey Down Hills. No doubt about it, our first Snoop secret mission was a failure. Billy said it was because Pearl had probably run off to the circus. Smart billies, apparently. I said I thought he'd got the name the wrong way round. No, Billy told me. He'd made up the circus name himself after someone he knew very well, and it was definitely Smart Billy. Well, I didn't think he knew anyone smart by the name of Billy, but I didn't like to say so. Instead, I told Billy there was no way Pearl could be at a circus, and he said she might be because he once heard her say she had to walk a tightrope. I said that it was just a turn of phrase, but Billy wasn't listening because he was too busy getting out his animals and pretending they were in Smart Billy's circus. Billy made the hippo a trapeze artist and the plastic dinosaur the clown. To be honest, if I came face to face with a dinosaur, I'm not sure I'd be laughing. I decided that we might have failed at our first attempt to bring Pearl back, but we're going to keep trying because Billy's not the same without Pearl. Last night, before bed, he drew Pearl inside a heart and asked me if she still loved him. I said she did, and nothing would change that, and it didn't matter if we failed the first time round, because we could always try again. I'm not going to fail on my plan to say goodbye to Mum either. Not having said goodbye to her is like a tiny splinter under my skin. Sometimes I don't notice it, and other times I feel it's there, and I know I have to deal with it, or it will stay there forever. I'm sitting in Mum's favourite armchair now, and it feels warm, safe and comforting. And I'm writing the goodbye list. It's a list of ways to say goodbye to Mum, and I'm going to make it really special. I've decided I will come up with ten ways to say goodbye, and I'll try each and every one of them. And I'll know when I hit on the right one, because I'll have that fuzzy feeling in my tummy. As if, as if I've been eating mega sour sweets. The goodbye list. Number one, write a poem called goodbye. Number two, write the word out in sparklers. Number three, create a little shrine. Number four, draw a picture. Number five, send a balloon into the sky. Number six, name a star. Number seven, design my own tattoo. Number eight, plant a seed. Number nine, just say goodbye. And number ten, can't think of a number ten, so we'll say nothing here until I have an idea. 
The rest of the half-term holiday I get busy trying out the goodbye list. For starters, I try number three and build a shrine to mum using Billy's building bricks. Only by the time I go to the toilet and come back, Billy has already pulled it apart and says I'm not allowed to play with his toys. I say I wasn't, and Billy says it's nothing to be embarrassed about because Dad never, never is when he plays with that remote control helicopter he keeps under his bed. Thing is, I don't bother trying to build another shrine to mum because somehow a few plastic bricks don't seem to be good enough. Nope, a shrine is definitely not how I want to say goodbye to my mum. Next, I try writing a poem. Goodbye, didn't the time fly? You had to go, I don't know why. I still think of you and sigh. This is my poem, to say goodbye. In the end, that doesn't feel right either and it makes me sad. So sad that dad comes into the bedroom and says I shouldn't be moping about. I say I like moping about and dad says there's plenty of time for that when I'm a teenager. Dad? My voice goes so high only dogs can hear it. Do you think I could have some sparklers? Number two on the goodbye list, here I come. But then there I go because dad replies, remember, remember, it's nowhere near the 5th of November. Then he says, Beckett, and his voice goes even higher than mine. Sit down. I have something to tell you. I have a feeling I'm not going to like this. I am right. I know this will be a little shock, but now the half-term break is almost over and we're settled into this new flat. I've arranged for you both to go to a new school. It's called Bleeding Heart and it's closer to this flat than your old school. You can walk home together now. Dad reaches out and tries to take my hand, only I pull away. Little shock. No, a little shock is when you touch a door handle and you get a tiny jolt of static. This is a huge shock. Nearly enough to blow me right off my feet and give me crazy hair, like when you rub your head with a balloon. Well, I don't mind saying that my jaw is on the floor, along with my stomach. After I've recovered, I tell Dad I won't be going to a new school. Isn't it bad enough that we're in a new flat? Dad, his voice as soft as butter, says, You will. Then he adds that he's heard it's very nice there. Who has he heard that from? I ask him. Dad says, The head. At this point, I'm so angry I have to check my own pulse. Look, Dad, I wail. The stress is sending my heart rate sky high. Dad says I have the heart of an ox. And I say I don't, actually. I have the heart of a ten-year-old human, and right now it's about to explode into one million pieces. I add, what about my mates at my old school? Will I see them again? Dad says, I'll make new friends. What kind of living hell is this? I haven't said goodbye to Mum, I haven't said goodbye to Pearl, and now I haven't said goodbye to my mates either. Later on, Billy has a nightmare and nudges me awake at 5.43 in the morning. I crawl out of bed saying I can tell him a story to make him fall asleep again. It's just what Mum used to do for me. Billy says he'd like that, and we both sit in Mum's armchair, curled up like two little prawn crackers. At first I don't have a clue what sort of story to tell, but that's when I have an idea. Let me tell you a story. I say, of two boys, two brothers, who are making a journey, a journey in an armchair. I look down. An armchair just like this. Let me tell you how they survived the most terrible storm and how the armchair made sure they travelled safely to their destination. Billy swallows and looks up at me. Okay. A long time ago, two boys set off on a journey along with many others. They weren't sure what the land they were going to was like, but they knew they could no longer stay on the land they had lived on for many years because it was disappearing. So they had to move forward to survive. They bundled up all of their belongings, which wasn't much, just what they were wearing in an old armchair. They climbed on board the armchair and pushed it off into the ocean. Others did the same with their own vessels. It was sunny for the longest time, and after a while the two boys could see the new land in the distance. Everything was going exactly as they hoped. They were going to make it. I like this story, says Billy. The armchair was safe. It was, I reply, for a while. But when they were halfway across the ocean, the air changed, and the clouds got heavy and dark. There was a storm coming. Billy cuddles closer to me. 
the rain came first, and it felt like lots of tiny swords because it was so sharp. Then there was thunder loud, like thousands of party poppers going off all at once, and the lightning lit up the land in front of them, and it seemed further away than they first thought. One of the brothers wanted to turn back, but the land behind them had disappeared for good. I don't like the storm in this story, whispers Billy, slumping down in the armchair. All they could do was hope the storm would pass, only it didn't pass as quickly as they thought it would. They clung on to the chair, afraid of what would happen to them. They waved at others who were making the journey too, but they were invisible to those around them, because everyone else had troubles of their own, riding out the storm. Billy's face slackens and he bends forward. They were invisible. Well, not actually invisible, I reply, but others didn't notice them, even though they were crying out for help. Perhaps they couldn't hear because the wind was so loud. Again, the boys called out. They called to the sky, the air and the sea. Shaking his head, Billy responds. Did anyone hear? Oh, yes. Someone heard. Godzilla, says Billy, perking up. I mean the Loch Ness Monster. Neither, I reply. They couldn't see who it was. But they heard a voice carried on the wind saying, I am the whisper in the wind, the rustle of the leaves, the shiver of winter and the warm breath of summer. I am the cloud galleon that sails the sky and the moon that skips across the surface of the water. I put on a whole new voice for this bit, imagining myself winning an Oscar for still storytelling. Oh, says Billy. I smile thinking he's impressed with my storytelling. Perhaps I'm as good at it as Mum was. Billy's eyes droop. I don't like that silly whispering wind stuff, though, he murmurs. Billy puts his thumb into his mouth and begins to drift back to sleep. I promise to tell you who the voice belongs to another night, I whisper, as Billy lets out a tiny sigh. I promise you this story will have a happily ever after. And that concludes our chapter three and I'll be back very soon for chapter four.